Hey guys, just a quick phone vlog today. Um, obviously, I'm not at the office today. Today uh, is election day as I'm recording this. I actually just got finished voting and I'm heading home. And you know, I thought, what would be a good topic to discuss? Well, one of the things that's been on my mind for a little while, people often ask me about why I choose particular pieces of software that I use, you know, everybody always asks, you know, why do I use this particular terminal? Why do I use this particular text editor, this particular browser, uh, window managers, things like that? What is it that is the deciding factor for me to use some of this stuff? And a lot of it for me, the way I think about it is, is some of the software future proof? I think about is this piece of software that I'm about to invest some time in, especially anything that requires a real investment of my time. For example, like a text editor like Vim or Emacs, you know, that takes a lot of time to invest. Is it worth it? Is it going to be around in the future? Uh, again, is it future proof? Same thing with my browser. Same thing with, I don't know, file managers, video editors, things like that. You know, you have to think about these things. The most obvious question you have to ask is, is it future proof in terms of will this piece of software be around in five years, 10 years, 20 years down the road? Uh, is it a, a one-man project? Is that one person going to decide not to work on that piece of software, you know, down the road? And then, of course, the software becomes abandoned where you got to worry about things like that. That's one of the things that I consider. The other things I consider when I talk about is a piece of software future-proof, is it flexible? Is it customizable, right? Can you do what you want to do with that particular piece of software? I don't like pieces of software that are very rigid and, and you know, inflexible pieces of software. Uh, an example that immediately comes to mind is GNOME 3. The GNOME 3 desktop environment I thought was very rigid, very limiting. I would have never used that particular desktop environment. I'm not really a desktop environment user anyway, but even if I was a GNOME fanboy, you know, the early versions of GNOME 3 especially, they were so bad, they were so limited uh, in what they did. They weren't very flexible. They weren't very customizable. It was just a real mess. And, you know, that's not future-proof. Future-proof to me is that flexibility, that customization. Uh, with my tiling window managers, people often ask me why I run things like Qtile and Xmonad, things like that. And it's because they're very much future proof because the only real person that's b behind that desktop environment, if you will, is essentially me because I'm configuring that particular window manager. So really, in some ways, uh, even though I'm not the dev of Qtile, I'm not the dev and the lead dev of Xmonad, in some ways I kind of am because I have to configure them. You know, I have to write my configuration files from scratch and everything. And then once I get it to where I want it and maintain it, it's pretty much set. It's done. I never have to worry about it again. Another thing I look for in software is, is it modular? Is it component based, right? Is it the small little modular programs basically that are combined into one gigantic program? Because that is part of that flexibility, that customization that comes into play with software. Things like Emacs, for example, right? It's very modular. Right, uh, Emacs is essentially a, its own package manager, and when you build your own Emacs configuration, it basically goes and installs these various Emacs programs, right? These modules, and you know it creates your text editor, your IDE. So I really think modular software is part of being future-proof. I think that's a very important thing. And another thing I really, of course, focus on with my software is: does it embrace? open standards? Is it licensed under a free and open source license? Obviously, I prefer to use free and open source software. If I have to use proprietary software, I will if that's the only thing available. But I do like pieces of software, even if it's proprietary software, that do have some open components. Does it embrace some open standards, some open APIs? That's always a positive. That's always a positive, especially in that future-proof kind of thing, because those open standards, typically, they're much longer lasting than proprietary standards. One of the things people will ask me about my software choices is, you know, does ABC piece of software, does it work on Wayland? Because a lot of the Wayland fanboys especially are worried about me using programs that are Xorg only. And I, I get that. And I certainly am starting to move toward... Uh, thinking about Wayland. Wayland's going to become a reality for most of us within the next, I don't know, three or four years probably. Maybe 
quicker than that. We'll see. But, you know, a lot of the big programs that I invest a lot of time in, things like Emacs, for example. Emacs works on X. Emacs works on Wayland. I have no problems with that. My window manager, my tiling window manager of choice these days, I've been running Qtile. Qtile works on X. It also is kind of experimental, but it kind of works on Wayland as well. So it's kind of future proof in that aspect as well. And a couple of other things I want to talk about with software. You know, I really like software that looks forward a little bit and they see the writing on the wall. For example, AI. AI integration is a thing. Like these AI tools, especially like these chat assistants like Olama and things like that, they are kind of the future and more pieces of software are going to integrate these. And I think more pieces of software should integrate these things. I would love to have some of these uh, AI tools, some integration with these AI chat assistants, for example. I would love to see some of this integrated into my desktop environments and my window managers and my web browsers and things like that. And many of these are starting to do that. I think that's a smart sign. What I don't like, though, is sometimes pieces of software go in crazy directions like they start adding features literally no one asks for and that's always dangerous we've seen this happen in the past where pieces of software and projects just completely fall apart because somebody kind of takes it in a direction that was like literally nobody was asking for these features nobody wanted these features but they integrated it anyway and sometimes that can cause a real divide within that particular uh, especially if it's an open source project so i try to avoid pieces of software where I see them, you know, all over the place. One obvious example, Mozilla Firefox. I know I criticize it a lot, but it deserves a lot of the criticism it gets. You know, Mozilla Firefox there for a while was just trying to do way too damn much, right? <laughs> Instead of focusing on just being a browser, they were trying to be everything from, you know, email client and a VPN service, and they were trying to do news feeds. And it was way too much, and then they got into some political activism. It's like, damn, just give me a browser right so you know I try to avoid pieces of software that are just all over the place like that so that's just some of my thoughts on why I choose most of the software that I choose you know the particular programs that I like to run a lot of it is that kind of you know I ask myself is it future proof I have certain things that you know I look for in my software and you know I hopefully you guys have some standards as well I don't know I don't know if I'm just the weird one you know that kind of has a checklist that I go through and check things off and you know if things meet the checklist then I'll use it anyway ran over guys peace